Hello, I'm not too sure uh, what happened. Hopefully we can get some assistance. Okay, so we will um, get Christine up to the screen, up to the stage. Christine, are you there? Hi, Christine. So we have Christine Yip from MENA. Uh, Christine leads the community efforts at MENA Foundation and was previously part of the community team at O1 Labs. She has broad experience in multidisciplinary engineering teams and works for global firms in the US, the Netherlands, Czech Republic, and Hong Kong. And her talk is going to be on building communities in crypto. Are you ready, Christine? Yes, yeah. thank you so much, Kwame. Thank you, sorry about that. No worries. Um, maybe let me first start sharing my screen. Um, all right. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Christine Yip, and I lead the community efforts at MENA Foundation. And today I'm very happy and honored to um, talk about building communities in crypto. Um, so before I joined MENA Foundation, I was part of the community team at O1 Labs. And um, that was the team that incubated MENA protocol. And I had the privilege and this chance opportunity to be part of this great experience of building a community from, from scratch. Um, so maybe first let me share with you some highlights of what MENA has achieved. Um, MENA was the largest proof of stake testnet community outside of Ethereum 2.0. And that was built just within one and a half years. So one and a half year earlier, we had zero community members. Um, earlier this year in April, we had concluded our token sale. It was oversubscribed by almost nine times, and we had the highest number of purchasers in Coinlist history to date at that time. Um, and for our crypto project of our age, we have a notable large base of members from all over the world who are following Mina's progress. And just on Twitter, we have over 150,000 followers. Um, and we have more than 90% staking participation and over 200 members who started their staking pools on MENA, which is incredible participation from the technical community. So I guess the question is, how did we start from nothing and get here, achieving all these milestones in just about two years? Um, the answer is the community. Um, so MENA is powered by participants. Um, the project got to where it is today because of MENA's community members. And open source collaboration and decentralization are, in my opinion, the essence of blockchain. It's a future where everyone has a hand in building it and where we're all owning our future. So I guess then the next question is, how do these members in the community make an impact? Um, a very helpful way to explain this is by looking through an impact lens. Um, so this is an impact lens. It's a tool to visualize and understand how a contribution from a member can impact the community members around them and the broader ecosystem and the project in the end. Um, so often it starts with a member creating or building something to enhance their own experience. Um, for example, when we just started, um, when we had our first testnet beta ever, um, the software was still unstable. So we had members who built um, restart scripts, scripts to restart their nodes. Um, another example is of um, members who are building tools or spreadsheets to calculate staking rewards. Um, and there are also members who are looking into MENA, doing research, and might make some notes. So um, 
And then what often happens is that these members would share what they've built or created with members who are in a similar situation. So the member, the node operator who wrote the script might share it with a fellow node operator who they met on the channel. Um, if you're the member who built the tool or spreadsheet and you see that someone else is trying to find out what the staking rewards are as well, then you might be willing to share it with them too. Um, and if you've already looked up some things about Mina or the project that you're interested in and you see that other members are asking the same thing, you might be um, willing or open to sharing the knowledge with them too. So this is when members start to impact users around them and they start making an impact in the local community. Um, um, and often what happens is that members realize that they what they do is really making an impact and they go down this rabbit hole where they start polishing in their th the things up that they've created. Um, so it can be shared more broadly and also enhance the experience of many more members. Um, so for example, the member who created the script might add more instructions or tidy up the code. The member who created um, the tool or spreadsheet might write tutorials or more instructions how to use the tool or make the UI prettier, like this example at the right. Um, members who made some research notes might decide to write a blog or maybe put it in a video or publish it on a website. And once um, these new contributions are out there in the world, other people can use it and people, when people see it, they might be sparked to help refining it. So um, for example, if the script was open source, other members might be willing to add to it and build on top of it and add additional features. Um, people who build tools and spreadsheets um, and who are using it, they might get inspired to add additional calculations or make build new tools for different scenarios. Um, and um, people who might have seen the blog or the video or the website, they might want to help the first contributor with maybe design or they offer to help with proofreading. And um, people engage uh, with the community, uh, with this contribution. Um, people often comment, they like, they share. I'm very sorry about that. And they bring the perfection contribution to an even larger audience. And the most um, the interesting moment is when other people start to build on top of it. And, and again, they start with something sim simple. But when they do that, that's the moment when this local impact becomes, um, starts to impact also the broader ecosystem. Um, so for example, if we go back to the examples for that script, um, other members might build new scripts that depends on yours if you wrote one. Um, and for the tools and spreadsheet, people might build new tools that pull data from yours. Um, and about the, that pretty website and blog or video, um, people who learned about it and benefited from your knowledge might build their own projects. Um, and actually it goes through the entire cycle again. Um, so they start with in a, starting with building something simple, they enhance their own experience, and then they share it with people around them and they enhance the experience of people around them. And other people get inspired, it might get, um, it might spark um, new ideas and they start to help contributing to the existing tools. And in the end, what we see is that um, members are collaborating on um, helping each other to succeed. Um, so going back to this impact lens, there are many different ways how it can start. Um, for example, just by helping answering questions or sending a link to other members, um, or sending them to the contributions of other members. Um, even if you're just enhancing the experience of the memory next to you, 
you can be contributing to a ripple effect that can be felt over the entire ecosystem. Um, so I'd like to give a few examples of how I've seen this happen in practice in Mina's community. Um, for example, a community member built this custom archive node with GraphQL API. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I see that I'm actually behind. <laughs> Very sorry about this. Um, so uh, yeah, a member built this custom archive node with GraphQL API. Um, and there are a lot of other tools uh, that are built on top of it and by using this GraphQL API. For example, members build um, scripts and tools for MENA's delegation program. They, um, other members build a tool that can evaluate staking performance and help people choose a staking pool. Um, people build um, a MENA node monitor um, and much more. Um, so here's another example where community members started building um, websites and tools and blogs. And uh, another community member who saw all this um, built this directory where everyone can find all the contributions in one place. Um, so there are a lot of possibilities and different types of contributions. Um, and I guess another question could be, which contribution is crucial for community building? Um, what is everyone's impact on a community, actually? Um, so to find out, maybe let's follow a day out of this MENA community member's life named Chris. Um, he's a teacher in real life, has a nine to five job. He goes home and every day in a few hours after work, he hangs out in our community. Um, let me walk you through his daily routine. So he turns on his computer and he would always first check out the latest updates in Mina's ecosystem. And for that, he visits this website called Mina Crypto that a community member built. And it shows the latest official news and announcements, but it actually shows more than that. It also shows news and updates that even the team at the foundation sometimes doesn't know about. Contributions from members um, are sometimes happening everywhere and things get hidden in different pockets of the community and it's really challenging to follow it. But Mina Crypto helps with that. Um, other things that Chris uh, um, loves to check out or participate in are, for example, a community lab telegram group where there are daily quizzes and podcasts. Um, he makes use of um, these blogs. He checks out videos from other members. He, he uses wallets that are built by the community. He um, consults um, validated dashboards and block explorers that are built by community members. So there are different array of things. Um, so maybe just a quick break um, and I'd like to do a quick poll. Out of all these members and contributions, who do you think was the most impactful for building a crypto community. I'm just curious what everyone would think. Um, are there any guesses? Would it be the member who built the blog explorer or the wallet? Oh, how do I go back to the chat? <laughs> I'm trying to look at what people are guessing, but um, oh, here, here everyone is. <laughs> All right. Blog Explorer, Caitlin says. Yeah, the question was, um, who do you think was the most impactful for building a crypto community in all these examples? Um, so you saw that this member, Chris, was using the Block Explorer or these validated dashboards or these wallets that other members build or the websites or the community-led telegram groups. Um, from these examples, <laughs> which one do you feel is making the biggest impact? 20 yeah, Twitter, there's a, 
that's yeah um twitter can be very impactful and have a big influence i agree um i guess um something that you do not know yet is that chris enjoys this community so much that he created a small study group for fun um so there were just a handful of members who would often drop by and talk together about Mina and study and learn together in the study group. So here you see a screenshot of the study group on our Discord. And it wasn't such a big project with such a large following or user base like the Block Explorer or the Wallets or the YouTube videos or Twitter, like Tim said. But there's a fun fact. What you see here there's a small number of participants in the study group, and they're just the tip of the iceberg. The creators of the Block Explorer, the wallets, and the dashboards and the vlogs that were mentioned earlier, they were all active members in the study group, and they all talked here and learned from each other. So do you realize what Chris did? He actually helped others to learn about Mina, he sparked conversation, he sparked ideas, and he helped others to make their first contributions and to succeed. Um, so yeah, <laughs> any idea who you, who I think was the most crucial to build a community? Um, so nowadays, Chris is no longer a teacher. I'm feeling very happy and honored that he joined my team, the community team at Mina Foundation. And every day, he helps others to take that first step and helps them to start that chain reaction you saw earlier with the impact lens. And he's building the community and ecosystem together with all his fellow community members. So yeah, remember how the community was at the heart of Mina and how Mina was powered by participants? This can actually apply to any other project in crypto that also embrace that open source and collaborative spirit. Um, and to all the makers out there, um, it's important to foster any type of contribution um, from the community and build together with the community. Because even the smallest type of contribution can end up having the largest ripple effects and it will all contribute to the exponential growth of a new ecosystem and a new future. All right, thank you. Thank you, Christine. That was a great presentation. And uh, we will get into the questions and answers. And the first question, what is the most challenging part of building a community on Discord? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, challenging part, I guess it's, um, I personally feel that the most challenging part is to meet the demand. <laughs> Often there's, um, there can be so much going on, on in the community, in these channels, that it's even hard to keep up <laughs> and to answer all the questions. Um, what what we, we are very lucky that we have a super, super active community members who we can rely on. And I must say that if they weren't around, then yeah, our Discord <laughs> wouldn't be the same. Does does that answer the question? I saw it was asked by an anonymous person. Yeah, that's a that's a really good answer. Um, next question: uh, Do you have an opinion on the first place to start when building the community? Um. Yes. So. I, I know something went wrong when I showed the impact lens. Um, but I guess um, what, where I would start is nurturing all types of contributions and especially those um, who are leaders in the community because they are the one who will start the chain reaction. And um, that's also what you've seen what Chris was doing. Um, and um yeah they are the ones who start that ripple effect um i guess identifying them and nurturing them that would be the place where i would start um next question what slash who is the community um that's 
that's a great question. Um, I I personally feel that um, community used is used very broadly in crypto. Um, in my mind, the community members are the people who are um, who are belonging in Mina's community and who are choosing to contribute and to be part and to participate. Um, so maybe just a fun fact, in our team, we divide things into, um, uh, we look through uh, at things um, as a marketing funnel. So we have the top of the funnel and those are um, people who just learned about Mina, for example, the people who are following us on Twitter, um, people will come in uh, on Telegram. And then we have also middle of the funnel where people um, start to engage more. Maybe they look up more information about Mina or they start to learn how to operate a node. Um, and then we also have the bottom of the funnel. And those are really the members who are adding value to the project and start building stuff. Um, so for me, community would be bottom of the funnel. And um, our next question, um, I sometimes find Discord communities really overwhelming. How do you moderate channels and link to resources? Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> I really feel this person. I, I actually have the same. Um, yeah, we've, ex to be honest, we've experimented with different approaches. Um, uh, we had, uh, members uh, who are very passionate about helping other members uh, and we onboarded them into the mod squad and they were amazing they helped they were everywhere they could answer all the questions technical ones non-technical ones they were super helpful um, they helped each other even outside of their shifts um, we tried that out. And another thing that we also tried out and are trying out now actually is onboarding um, a third party professional moderation agency. Um, and currently it's going well. Um, but yeah, I would think that even with the moderators around with a growing community, it's always hard to keep up. So in a healthy community, I think we would always be relying on each other and members would also be helping each other um, to keep this space safe. Um, uh, what if there is no demand on Discord? How do you generate the attention for it? Um, that's a good one. Um, well, we have been very focused from a start on building a technical community. Um, so what we've done is, um, for, uh, if I go back to the top of the funnel, uh, we've been directing members to telegram for general questions. And whenever there's deeper questions, uh, more technical questions, we would direct members to discord. So there's a different purpose for every platform that we're using. Um, and maybe that helps with attracting the right audience to the right channels. Um, do you think the uh, do you think the choice of chat platform is important? Um, interesting question. Um, I think definitely yes, um, because on every platform there are different audiences. Um, and on some platforms, the barrier to participate is also higher, um, but that doesn't always need to be um, a disadvantage. For example, maybe if I can use Discord as an example again, if Discord is the channel for bottom of the funnel members, members who really want to dive deeper, members who really want to become more invested in Mina, then maybe that barrier would help to make that separation who, who are really the bottom of the funnel members who are willing to go deeper, dive deeper, spend time on it. 
uh, and the members who are just here to look around more casually. And the next question, um, how globally dis uh, dispersed is the media community? Do you have a difficult time building community with folks whose uh, native language is not English? That's a great question, Caitlin. Um, so we have members um, oh, really, re yeah, our community is really globally dispersed. Um, I think we have some data from our grants recipients uh, and they're from almost 40 countries, if I remember correctly. And language barrier is definitely also sometimes that I see is challenging, um, especially when you have um, online um, or or verbal communication. Um, so I guess um, the way we handle this is to be first to be thoughtful about it. Um, so in in meetings we might try to um, talk slower, although I sometimes also forget it. But we do try to be aware of it. We also try to be mindful to have written notes to share with the community afterwards because that's just easier to translate, uh, easier to look back, or maybe um, in a written form is also easier for non-native folks to understand sometimes. Um, we're also looking into tools, for example, um, automatic uh, transcript creation, um, or maybe by um, encouraging members to not only give feedback verbally during meetings and calls, but also in the chats or using online whiteboards, um, these kind of uh, methods. And um, from Pete, how how do you create a, no uh, create a, a noise without spamming? How do you create a noise without spamming? I'm not sure whether whether I understand this question. Um, oh right, how do you do you if if the question is how do you how do you get the people to notice you and grab people's attention without spamming too much? Um, if that's the question, then I guess the tip that I can give is um, perhaps try to do it in a respectful way um, that doesn't, um, and, and not to repeat, um, and don't um, repeat it too often. And definitely uh, the most important thing is if you need help, reach out to the team um, because the team can also help to highlight um, any of your new projects, new initiatives, uh, or things that you're trying to do, or things that you've already built but want to share with others. Um, uh, so yeah, we're, we're very, very happy to help our members to succeed and support them in the things that they want to do. So I guess the number one tip would be, after trying yourself, feel free, or in parallel to trying it yourself, uh, please also reach out to the team and we can help you out. And the last question, um, Mina question, what is the time frame for SNAP SDK release on testnet? <laughs> um, that is actually also um, a question that I'm wondering about. Um, so we don't have a um, firm time frame yet. Um, it's in the works and um, yeah, hopefully we can share an official update on that soon. Um, the entire team is very excited about it. Um, but yeah, we're doing research, R&D, and ex execution uh, in parallel. So sometimes it's very difficult to give a firm date. Um, but when we know, we'll definitely share with the community. And for the last question, um, how do your other marketing strategies currently integrate together with your community building on platforms such as Discord? Um, yeah, very interesting question. Um, I'm trying to think of examples of marketing strategies um, that are now integrated with Discord. Um, 
and I'm, to be honest, none, not many come to mind right now. Um, but um, I guess our marketing team, um, they often focus on top of the funnel um, and the community team and our team in, in MENA Foundation focus on bottom of the funnel. Um, so we do collaborate with each other um, by running campaigns on different platforms together. Um, for example, we have right now the eGIF campaign, Educative GIF campaign. Um, we also had um, Snarkoween campaign events, um, and we would try to uh, involve both members on um, platforms like Telegram and also Discord. Um, that is it for all the questions. Thank you much. Uh, thank you so much, Christine, for that great presentation. Someone who deals with community myself at Chainsafe, it was really inspiring and learned a lot. And uh, next up, we are going to have Leon Doe. He is the head of gaming at Chainsafe. In his free time, he's a prolific uh, fisherman, rock climber, and surfer. And for his talk, is going to be Game Engines in Web3. Let me invite to the stage my workmate, Leon Doe. What's going on, Kwame? Yeah, ready, that dude. is definitely ready. related to you. <laughs> you ready, dude? Yeah, ready to go. All right, man. Okay. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Just want to make sure. Okay. Um, so what, when I started this presentation, I was thinking like, oh, this is going to be super technical and kind of dig into the weeds of all of it, all of it. but I figured let's let's take a step back and make this more generalized. Um, so I broke it down into uh, a journey. So three chapters. Uh, chapter one is the hackathon, kind of the, the beginning of how this started. Uh, number two is the product, where we currently are. And number three is the, is the vision. And uh, along the way, I've learned uh, really important lessons. And uh, I just wanted to share with you guys. So, so this started, um, I think, last year, right, July 6th or... I'm not sure exactly. I don't know where I got this picture, but uh, it started with, with HackFS. So shout out to Juan. He's going to be talking uh, right after this. Shout out to the uh, Protocol Labs team uh, for sponsoring this. So it started off with, um, yeah, this hackathon. And the idea was to build um, anything on IPFS, Falcoin, it was an out, out at the time, um, or uh, libp2p, right? So any of the PL uh, protocols. And uh, me joining a lot of hackathons and losing a lot uh, my goal is to like try to step it up and, and work on something uh, serious. So uh, as always, I jumped in trying to tackle uh, like big problems, right? Uh, so big in fact that I don't even have a description because uh, it's so complicated. So it was me and my buddy and we were like, okay, let's, let's spend a day and uh, brainstorm on, on what to do. So we came back the next day and I told my buddy like, hey, I got three ideas. Which one do you think is the best? So uh, these were the ideas. Idea number one, let's build a DeFi application. Uh, sounds very familiar, but uh, yeah, let's do that. Uh, idea number two, let's build a wallet, right? For, for hackathon projects. And idea number three is build a DeFi wallet, right? Uh, and my buddy, long story short, like shut me down. He's like, Leon, uh, we always come up with these ideas and all, all of our hackathons, we always lose. Let's not do that. Right. So, so I took a step back and I thought, okay, um, let's, let's think of something else. Right. But not, uh, not so serious. So I thought, okay, why is web three so serious in the first place? And I was thinking maybe, maybe it's just me. Right. So I had a, a different perspective after I've had that, uh, that chat with him. Hey, hey, so, sorry to interrupt. Um, your, your microphone is rubbing against your sweater. Sorry about that. Oh, cool. Uh, is that good now? I think so. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. Sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. So, uh, yeah, tell me if it happens again. So, uh, so I thought, okay, let's make this less serious, right? Um, so, on a spectrum of uh, many serious and and meme, where many serious is is your DeFi, your wallet, where you know money and, and lots of funds is at stake, or meme, where uh, there is no money or it's kind of like flashy. I wanted to be more in the middle, but more entertaining, right? So the idea after that was to uh, let's focus on let's focus on games. 
So uh, the, the big idea for that hackathon was let's build a game with a gaming engine, not so much using HTML, CSS, but like a gaming engine like Unity or Unreal and put that on, on IPFS. That was the goal. Uh, the goal was to basically build uh, an immutable game, right? That once it's pinned, um, it's difficult to take down. Um, as some of you might know, websites uh, live around three, three months, four months, and, and it's dead, right? So would it be nice to have a game that kind of lives indefinitely? Um, you can definitely uh, fact check me on that by just going to Product Hunt and going through the history and, and clicking on links and almost all of them are dead. So uh, why not have a game that, that kind of lives on for a while? And uh, I didn't know how to do this. So I went on, uh, online on Google and I searched, you know, IPFS uh, Unity. And I found one forum, um, like a sub forum somewhere on how to do this. And this was like years ago. So I figured, okay, no one's done this or no one's really explored this. So let's give it a shot. You know, we had a couple of weeks, let's give it a shot and, and see if it worked out. Um, luckily <laughs> it worked out. And uh, not only was I able to put a game on IPFS, but I was able to um, document it and kind of explain how to do it step by step. So I published this article um, and uh, people started realizing, oh, like, oh, you can actually do more with, with this technology, like combining these two things. Um, and not just that, but other, other teams like, um, like Slate, shout out to Cake, uh, are also exploring this space. So Slate is, is a way to, to host um, information on Filecoin IPFS. They also have a, a section down here for games. Um, so people are starting to explore this. This was not the case last year. Um, people are, are exploring it um, right now. So what's the take home message for, for chapter one? Uh, take home message is like, don't take things too seriously, right? Like, like have fun, right? Uh, we're not here, at least I'm not here to solve the problem, but focus on solving a problem, right? You never know where it's gonna take you. So that's chapter one. Um, so chapter two is the actual product. And this is a continuation of chapter one, the hackathon. And that is, um, okay, we have a game that's uh, immutable, right, on, on IPFS. But what if I have pieces in there that I want to mutate, I want to change, I want to update, I want to uh, level up? Uh, that's difficult, right? So that's when I started exploring uh, the blockchain side, like the Ethereum, the EVM uh, part of it. And I wanted to stick with the original idea of using a game engine instead of um, HTML, CSS. And once again, one on Google searched how to connect Unity to uh, MetaMask or Unity to a wallet or, or the blockchain. And I found uh, very little, if not any, documentation. So spent uh, uh, a crazy amount of time looking into this and um, figured out bits and pieces, right? And just a little bit of information that I found, uh, I just published it. So I wrote this article in uh, 20, October of 2020 on Unity Engine plus MetaMask Wallet, right? So an article, I think it was like maybe one page. If you just Google this, Unity MetaMask, you'll, you'll find it. Uh, it's like one page on how to do this. It's quite outdated. But right after this, um, people started reaching out. They're like, hey, like, do you have this um, already pre-made um, in, in like a package or a library I can install or download? I said, no, you'd probably have to write from scratch. And these guys kept asking and asking and asking. And I realized like, oh, this could be a thing. Um, so I started exploring more. And it's not just connecting to a wallet, but there's also the whole blockchain side of how do I connect to a blockchain like Ethereum, right? So after a while, I realized it's not just this piece, but we're missing a whole layer in, in, in stack. So, so what I mean is, um, let me break it down. So uh, you have the Web3 tech stack, right? On the left-hand side, you have your websites. So if you're trying to build uh, your uh, DeFi application on a browser, you have all the tech required, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, Web3.js that we also maintain, um, Ethers and Ethereum, right? We have all that to, to connect the front end, HTML, CSS with the back end, um, uh, Ethereum, right? We have that middle layer. But for gaming, uh, if you have a gaming engine, you're missing this piece. So nowadays, a lot of game developers are using the tech on the left-hand side and trying to convert it over to the right-hand side. So it's, it's using the wrong tools for the wrong job, basically. So this piece here is what, um, what we're trying to develop or what we're developing now. And we call it uh, Chainsip Gaming. So Kwame's involved, I'm involved. A lot of us here uh, listening in are also involved. And uh, what we currently have now is uh, not just one um, 
blockchain that we can connect to, but um, you know, six, six or more, plus more um, chains. And, and the cool thing, uh, which I'll explain later, <clears throat> is people are using other chains that I didn't even know worked. Like they were using uh, Rootstock, they're connecting to Rootstock, they're connecting to uh, Harmony, et cetera. Like things I didn't even realize you can do. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the really cool part. So what did I learn about um, this whole part two of the actual product? Well, part two is, is um, this feedback loop of creating something that you don't know if, if it's going to work or not and, and listening to the community, right? That, as Christina said. So luckily we have this Discord uh, channel where we publish um, new releases, have new updates, and we immediate get, immediately get feedback on what's good, what's not good, right? People are trying to break our things like on purpose, which is good. And we're trying to, to iterate on this. And so the, the big thing that I learned about part two is even if you're trying to create something small, um, a medium article, uh, a YouTube video, like even if it's 30 seconds and you don't think it's complete, like put it out there and, and, and listen, because you never know what it was. You know, you never know if it's going to be good or not. Because that article that I started with uh, the MetaMask and, and uh, was just like, ah, I guess it works, but there's no documentation. So I published it and that kind of kickstarted this cycle here. So now um, on our product side, we're trying to make this, this cycle as tight as possible, right? Create and iterate as quickly as possible. So that's what we have for the product. And for the vision, um, I thought about this, it, it might change, but uh, what I see is to connect game engines to Web3, right? So I think the, the browser, um, is is quite, it's definitely more evolved than what we have with game engines. Let's try to catch up, right? That's that's the idea, to connect game engines, the Web2 space with different blockchains, different protocols like IPFS. Um, that's the goal. However, um, it sounds easy, right? You have point A, which is Web3, point B, which is Web2, and you have a bridge, like one bridge. Uh, but it's not that, it's not that straightforward. There's actually, um, it's actually a maze. So this is kind of what it looks like, right? We have, um, if you break it down, you have multiple game engines, right? You have, and each game engine is broken down to different builds. So you can build for mobile, you can build for desktop, you can build for WebGL, you can build, et cetera, et cetera, or console. Um, and then when you have that, you can connect each different piece to different blockchains, right? Polkadot, um, Polygon, Ethereum, et cetera. And then you can connect that to different protocols such as IPFS. <clears throat> And then on top of that, you have the whole signing bit uh, with multiple wallets. So it's less of a bridge from point A to point B, but more of like a, a network like this. So over time, I realized, OK, there's, there's a lot of pieces moving. Uh, not everything's good. But our goal here is to let's focus on one piece at a time, like one connection here, for example, and, and make that our goal and work backwards. So the last piece that I learned um, was to work, to work backwards. Um, so what this means is vision, but backwards, right? So if you look at it, uh, chapter one was learning all the tools, right? Or, or as many tools as possible, experimenting with different things and knowing what they do. Part two is iterating and seeing what users want and don't want. Part three is actually you coming up with a vision and working towards that. But it's not that easy where you have uh, a vision and you say, I have all these tools, Let's, these tools will get me to that point. It, it, I actually learned it the opposite way. It's you have an endpoint, you have a vision, and then you think, what tools do I need to get there, right? It, instead, of, instead of the other way around. So that's kind of where we're uh, experimenting now. We're kind of pushing the boundaries of what tools can we use right now versus what tools can we well, have to build ourselves. So that's kind of the, the last piece that I've learned um, when it comes to, to vision, you know, work backwards. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you guys want to know more about the SDK, uh, visit gaming.chainsafe.io. Uh, you can also reach out to me on uh, Twitter and Discord. Uh, appreciate the time, thanks. thanks. Awesome presentation, Leon. Uh, it's good to hear some of the backstory of, of how everything got together. Um, let's see if we have any uh, question and answers or questions from the from the audience. I have a question. 
What's your favorite favorite part about working on the uh, the Chain Safe Gaming SDK? Yeah, uh, well, you probably know about this too, but um, as Christina said, the community. So what we do is is more on tooling. So kind of think of this as like Web three JS or Ether is for gaming engines, right? So it's a set of tools that you can connect to any smart contract that you want or any blockchain that you want. Uh, the cool thing is what people are doing with it. So we have teams that are, um, they basically have a game where you can go in and interact with different uh, DeFi protocols. So you have each bank, which has a different DeFi protocol. Uh, we have games that are NFTs where you can go in and lend your, your NFT to somebody else, earn off of that. And it's the cool part is just seeing what people use uh, with, with this tool and I'll build with this tool. That's the coolest part. Okay, um, how far are we from full-scale blockchain gaming adoption? What do we need to get there? Yeah, um, it's yeah, it's tricky. So right now it's quite early. If you were to ask about gaming last year, uh, there wasn't much. Like this year, or yeah, this year it's starting to to grow. I'm sure we're in this. When I see the the hockey stick curve, we're like at the bottom here. This is like ETH at like zero dollars. You know, in, in the pennies, we're very, very early. People are still experimenting with different tools. Um, same thing with us. There are lots of things, as I said, working backwards. Uh, we don't have the tools yet. So we're trying to develop that. And once that's good, build that foundation, people can build on top of it and, and create some really cool stuff. Um, next question. What are you most excited about uh, for 2022 with the SDK? Yeah, so we have, uh, yeah, I don't want to spoil it too much, but we have a couple of things in mind. Um, so as I mentioned, each game engine can be built for different platforms. For example, um, uh, Android, iOS, mobile, um, Android, iOS, desktop, etc. So that's uh, the main, that's the main goal uh, to build it once on a game engine and export it to different platforms. So that's one thing. We have other ideas to make uh, buying and selling easy. I won't spoil it too much. Uh, but yeah, those are, those are some ideas for 2022. Press. Um, next one, what web three games are you most excited about? Yeah, I, I think it's the ones that haven't been built yet. Right? These are the ones, like people right now, it's really cool. Um, I'll give you a story because I like stories. Uh, somebody just started using the SDK, let's just say, you know, this week, um, the way that they're progressing is so quick that by the end of the week, they're already deploying their smart contract and they're interacting with it and like building a game, not knowing anything about crypto week one or week zero. Um, so the progression is like really fast. So I'm excited to see, you know, people understand this stuff in a short amount of time. I'm really excited to see what happens next year. Well, true. Um, next question. Who are the main competitors to the gaming SDK and how do we shift the conversation uh, with them from zero sum to positive sum? Yeah, yeah that's a really good, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, so we have a few competitors. Um, we have some differences. So th the main difference is most of almost all of our competitors, all of our competitors are non-custodial, meaning when you create an account, all of your private keys are not your private keys. Um, they're their private keys. So uh, from the beginning, uh, our goal is to make things non-custodial, make things as open as possible. So that's our biggest differentiator. Um, they also focus more on uh, specific blockchains because for example, they raise a token. On our side, as you can tell from the slide, we are blockchain agnostic. So we connect with as many blockchains as possible, as, possible, as many wallets as possible. So those are our biggest differentiators. Uh, question, uh, when can we expect to make in-game in NFTs like crafting things and mint them as NFTs? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, so we don't have, so how do I explain this? We have these things called prefabs, which are drag and drop. You click and things just work. So we have that for your basic reads and writes. Uh, the minting part, essentially you have the tools to do that right now. You can do it today. Uh, but it requires a few more steps uh, on the developer to do. Our goal, um, we just mentioned this this morning, our goal is to like simplify that process and make it like one button. But functionality-wise, you can do it right now. 
whoever posted that one, it was in our stand up this morning. Mm, I know. That was our, uh, that was the last question. And um, dude, it was awesome to have you speak here a little bit of backstory on this um, and, you know, have yourself a great afternoon and uh, we'll get our uh, keynote speaker to pop up. So uh, for our keynote uh, speaker, we'll have Juan Benet from IPSF, uh, IPFS in Filecoin fame. And um, if you're ready, Juan, if you could uh, join the stage, please. Hey, dude. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're good. I'll, awesome. Uh, Thanks so much. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, can you see that? I'm guessing yes, because I can see it. So great, let's do it. Uh, hey, super excited to be here uh, speaking to everybody today. Um, really uh, you know, thrilled to be part of the conference. Uh, it's been really awesome to hear uh, a ton of the discussions so far. Um, really, it, it's been a great swath of, um, of kind of like a snapshot of the whole Web3 space. So uh, it's been great to see uh, so many different um, members from so many different communities. Uh, come together and, and talk about um, all the amazing things that are happening across uh, across the space. This has been a fantastic year for Web3, right? So um, I think it goes without saying just how um, much growth we've seen on all kinds of things, everything from um, deep tech improvements that you know a lot of people thought were impossible and you know or extremely far away uh, getting uh, delivered um, uh, this year by a lot of different groups, um, starting to uh, really show the power of economic primitives uh, from Web3 um, going into communities outside of building tech. So um, all of the amazing, um, like the rise of NFTs um, in art especially have been, has been amazing to see and great to see like so many communities adopt these different economic flows. Uh, There's a lot of really exciting and um, potential primitives there of, of building um, new creator economies that um, just have a different sort of like um, economic production model. Uh, and that's been, super amazing also like the rise of DAOs this year has been um amazing to see um just in terms of tons of people like i think you know tens of thousands maybe hundreds of thousands probably hundreds of thousands of people now participating in in um in in a lot of kind of web3 enabled communities um and that's it spells um, that does look really an amazing year to be uh to be just sort of witnessing this uh th this diffusion of of all of the tech that so many people have been working on for i don't know Eight, eight plus years, twelve years, uh, in some cases, um, you're kind of getting getting to this point. So it's been a long time coming. Uh, really, really awesome year. And so I wanted to kind of uh, spend a little bit of time reflecting uh, and looking ahead to um, uh, to next year, at least from you know uh, a corner, uh, you know, one of the corners of Web three. Uh, I've spent a bit of time thinking about kind of uh, data storage and where that's headed um, and how people will be using uh, computation over it. So um, I'll spend a bit of time talking about that, uh, and then. I wanted to talk a bit about um, funding structures for uh, for projects. I think you know one of the key components and contributions of the whole Web three space is just um, changing the way that um, uh, that different uh, again different economic models and different economic production systems uh, work work around uh, different different pieces. And so one of the key things that's happening in the crypto and Web three space is um, starting to build dramatically better economic structures for fund funding public goods. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that because I think it's one of the most promising things that uh, can come out of Web3. Um, and I kind of want to give a give a glimpse to kind of what might be possible. And yeah, so great, let's let's dive in. Um, uh, I wanted to kind of start with, you know, talking a little bit about, about IPFS. Uh, a lot of us have been super focused on talking about Falcon, um because uh, that's kind of where we're spending a ton of our time and energy and focus uh, uh, on. But I wanted to kind of uh, just uh, give give a a uh, little bit of like a like an awesome plug for for just how powerful the primitives ended up being here uh, around kind of how CADs work and how uh, being able to address any kind of object um, in this uh, content address way, um, being able to kind of serve it from anywhere, being able to like repair it and so on. We've seen so many things this year happen where you know the the power of decentralization and the power of being able to address uh, any information from any node and serve it uh, from every anybody. Um, has been you know brought to bear. There's been many cases where you know NFT um, uh, collections, 
you know, it started, you know, the beginning of the year with many like rug pulls and so on. And many communities kind of like got wise to that and started doing content addressing for everything and you know, prevented all of that, uh, that flow. Um, and then even kind of like entire platforms shutting down. Um, but then all of the creators, just <laughs> all of the, N the NFTs pointing to all of the content with content address links with, uh, with the CIDs, um, we're able to just, you know, <laughs> still serve everything and kind of, you know, have business as usual with a completely different group of people running uh, either the same software and in some cases, completely different software powering all the same assets. So that's been just awesome to see that like the primitives are working, the, the systems are working um, and, and all this stuff is, is uh, um, you know, really kind of building a dramatically more resilient uh, uh, network. Um, so, you know, uh, for me, who's been kind of uh, pushing on this for, for many years, it's been just phenomenal to see that, that kind of thing work. Um, uh, it made me reflect and, and go back to kind of this IPFS roadmap that uh, is part of the IPFS repo. Um, there's a ton of like really amazing uh, um, possibilities and, and kind of directions that the IPFS project could go in. Um, there's a lot of kind of different threads and, and they pull on different kinds of use cases and different kinds of communities and different kinds of goals. Um, so it's worth like kind of like revisiting a lot of this stuff and um, also thinking about how the public funding primitives that, that I'm going to talk about uh, later, a little bit later in the talk um, can be applied to um, you know, fulfilling a lot of the the promise here and, and a lot of the potential uh, visions for uh, for the future here. Uh, so you know, definitely in, encourage you to if you're interested in in IPFS and interested in in data distribution and and how we address information and so on, um, go to this roadmap and like poke around in the, in those different descriptions. These were written uh, quite a while ago, I think like a, a few years ago. Um, but there's a lot of stuff there that like has yet to uh, come to pass. Like for example, you know, I want to make it so. Um, you can have full, fully functioning web apps working across planets, um, and that you know we still need to uh, get all the tooling working well enough to actually make IPFS interplanetary. Um, but you know, and so there's there's you know varying degrees of um, of distance there, but uh, there's a lot of like really promising promising things. Um, and so if you're kind of interested in in any of these things, like definitely participate on GitHub or uh, or in the different chat streams and and whatnot. Um, and if you think there's some stuff there that like you would like to do and you think it would be really awesome to to work on um but you know you'd like like funding or like lack um uh, a team to to go work on it and so on uh, definitely uh, keep me and other people in the IPFS project posted because we can uh, start using some of the kind of the DAO funding primitives and the other kind of retroactive public funding structures and grant structures and so on uh to help people kind of um get started with with these kinds of things um it was cool to reflect on just kind of the browser upgrade path uh, when i started IPFS, um People told me that it, you know I'd never uh, succeed in, in convincing any browser to like actually adopt the protocol and like that it was never going to happen and so on or that it would take you know 20 30 years. Uh, it's been really great to see that like you know we're actually way ahead of schedule um, and we're now finally kind of getting integrated directly into browsers, which is fantastic. Um, we're not going as fast into kind of the OS upgrade path. It would be really amazing to now have kind of OS level services uh, directly in uh, you know ship test packages and whatnot that like work uh, uh, super well. Um, and so we need to kind of uh, work on this part and certainly mobile um, mobile needs to be like a much bigger focus for a lot of people. Um, so this this is, uh, you know, a vast, most of the interactions that humans have with, uh, with the internet is kind of all kind of mobile oriented. And while of course you can do all of the reads through gateways and whatnot, like that sort of works, uh, it'd be really, really awesome to have like fully functioning peer to peer uh, directly in mobile and, you know, have a, the kind of experience where like, you know, people in a in a room um, can interact with each other phone to phone without having to go through through a server somewhere. Um, uh, you know, major shout out to a ton of people and different groups that you know worked on on realizing all this. So uh, awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, so turning um, I to Falcon uh, uh, for a bit. Uh, you know, this year has been uh, just amazing. Like the, it's been the first year of the Falcon network uh, being live. A uh, ton of people have been working towards this uh, for for a long time. Um, the, we finally have the primitives to be able to create a, a massive scale decentralized storage network. And, and that's something that, um, again, when, when we started the Falcon project, like people said, you know, there's no way you're gonna get, you know, uh, a, a proper scale uh, decentralized storage network to actually compete with the cloud. You know, the cloud is massive. Like we're talking about um, uh, you know, hundreds of petabytes, exabytes, uh, getting to zettabytes of, of use of, data storage and so on. And like, there's no way you're gonna be able to um, uh, coordinate like tons of people around the planet uh, to actually provide a high quality service uh, at that level of scale. And it's just amazing to see the, the network grow so quickly to you know now I think 13 exabytes of 
um, of capacity in, in the network, which is totally absurd. Like this is where, you know, it took the cloud decade, like a decade and a half to get to that. Um, and of course, like, you know, uh, Moore's law and so on, catching up is always easier, but, you know, it's still kind of absurd that like that level of, of, um, uh, of capacity and, and um, a system of that magnitude was able to get scaled that quickly. And so that's, that's the power of Web3 and the power of incentive structures and the power of mechanism design and blockchain networks. It's like that you can create marketplaces and create um, uh, economies that can cause that to happen extremely quickly. And so like that's that's what's been uh, been really amazing to see and, and you know, uh, super, super promising. Um, you know, Parker is a very large uh, network, and so there's a lot of different different parts that go go into building something like this. Is um, like any blockchain network, it, there's many different components and so on. Um, went to reflection just like the you know then and now of like the last year, kind of uh, looking at and at mainnet lift up. And these figures figures are a little bit outdated, about a month or so. Um, but you know, sort of like looking at um, where Falcon was at mainnet and and where it is now, like you know, massive source capacity uh, increase. Uh, we Shift a ton of uh, upgrades to uh, make the chain have dramatically more bandwidth to be able to uh, onboard a lot more storage. Um, greatly increase the network security by by having multiple implementations on on mainnet. Um, getting to uh, many upgrades and improvements that were shipped by a lot of participants in the community, um, which is was really awesome to see kind of a proper upgrade process uh, working in in a, in a network. Um, it's been also really awesome to see the the storage costs and availability just. Um, you know, drive the price of storage uh, down, right? Like, so the curve economy makes the Falcon enable just super cheap uh, storage uh, on a network like this. And so it's been um, awesome to see like that actually work for large scales of data, which is which is great. Um, also, you know, going from the beginning of the year to now, like there's been a, a ton of improvement in um, all the different kind of developer uh, onboarding pathways for, um, you know, how to add storage uh, into the network, uh, how to, um, weave it into applications, how to um, use it for NFTs, use it for uh, a whole bunch of different use cases. And so, um, you know, a host of like different developed for tools and, and systems got, got built along the way. Um, there's also uh, a ton of cross-chain integration. So now there's uh, many bridges and, and other systems um, connecting Filecoin to the other blockchain networks and making it super easy to store um, data from those and then to use the data um, in, in those systems. So a lot of that is kind of bridges and oracles right now. Um, in the future, I think it'll be just totally cross-chain interactions that are kind of just direct messages from from one chain to another. Uh, also, uh, awesome to see like tons of applications and tools being built, um, massive momentum with tons of developers, projects, uh, organizations, and also a, a ton of startups being formed. Though I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. And and also really cool to see just useful storage uh, uh, scaling super fast. Right, so we're you know in millions in the scale of millions of deals now. Uh, 30 petabytes of storage, which is, um, you know, by far the largest uh, decentralized storage network uh, ever in terms of like uh, usage capacity, many orders of magnitude larger than any anything else uh, out there. And again, this figures I did it just in the last month. We've had now I think 10 million more NFTs, so um, that's growing uh, super fast, uh, and so that's that's pretty pretty awesome to see. Uh, cool. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about enabling a new startup. So the uh, one of the big uh, things that that happened over the last year is. Uh, a number of us kind of worked on creating this uh, sort of like builders funnel that can help developers learn, build, and launch uh, new new applications and new new um, systems, and then grow them over time. And so that starts at the, at the beginning with a whole set of dev developer resources, and it's a ton of different um, different uh, pieces that go into it to you know help people get started, help people uh, play around with the tech, um, help people um, kind of envision some potential application and some potential superpower they want to ship to the world and then how to translate that into uh, into an actual product that they, they can uh, ship to to the world. Um, and then we really leaned into hackathons as a way to um, enable people to have an opportunity to uh, you know have the time and focus and attention uh, from a set of people to actually work on those things. And so we, we worked, worked to, uh, with a whole um, number of many different different partners to um, you know have a ton of hackathons throughout the year. Uh, so that people could have um, a really great venue to kind of try out um, building things, and it's been amazing to see like what people have been have been building over time. Like there's been, um, I think, thousands of projects this year, um, and many of them have sort of gone on to become like the full time focus for the for the those builders. Um, many of them have turned into uh, into you know whole uh, production level projects by now. Many of them have turned into into startups or um, or or uh, public funded 
uh, oriented organizations. We need like better names for that. Some of them have turned into DAOs uh, and so on. So it's been really great to see like this whole funding funnel, uh, including kind of like um, ecosystem uh, investors and other kind of funding groups. Uh, I should add grants here. So like you, you, there's investments and grants for the like, different kind of types of funding, um, but all of that is sort of available in, in this funnel. It's been really great to see uh, that that working. So there's been um, you know, a ton of developer uh, activity, a uh, lot of hackathons, and um, it's been you know great to be able to see uh, people developing, building awesome things, shipping them, and then growing those projects. Um, you know, and, and you know, many have gone into accelerators and graduated from those, and and so on. And there's there's another one. Uh, it, I think there's, I don't know when the next application is, but it, but it's I think relatively soon. I think uh, I think it might be TechStars. I'm not 100 percent sure, but. Um, if you're interested in this and you're working on a project and, and you want to get um, accelerator support, uh, definitely reach out or like uh, look at the, um, there's some website I think that, that has a lot of this, this info. Uh, you know, here's a, a snapshot of some of the groups that um, built um, whole projects in this last year, uh, just through the builders funnel. So things like Ballast were, um, that are you know, securely distributing uh, software artifacts. So like builds and you know, releases for software all kind of connected to um, blockchains and so on, and distributed peer to peer with with IPFS and and back to the platform and so on. Uh, things like Mintgate that you know can token gate uh, access to to things using NFTs. Uh, things like Huddle that enable um, peer to peer uh, video meetings and then you know record things and and back them up into um, into Flatcoin, like take all the recordings and, and store them there, or um, actually integrate NFT backgrounds and NFT avatars. I think like that's what, what they're working on now. Uh, and you know this started like a year ago, like you know in the last year they've grown a ton. Uh, some other ones that are uh, uh, started more recently, in like in the last six months or so, uh, Mona started um, building a whole bunch of um, uh, spaces where the space that itself, like the room itself, is an NFT, and and so you know they can think of um, now enabling a lot of artists and creators to build extremely high quality environments and and uh, put in you know craft amazing experiences and turn that into into the actual NFT NFT product. Um, and then you can think of wiring up those spaces together with portals or be able to place NFTs in there. Or uh, now I think they just shipped uh, um, a multiplayer. So now you can like drop a link to a room and go hang out there and, you know, be with other people and have um, audio and, and everything. So like that's, um, you know, building the metaverse in kind of like a digital uh, first sort of way, in, you know, like you don't need to fit everything in, you know, you in space or anything. Then there's, uh, you know, uh, projects like WeatherXM where you know, they're building a uh, blockchain powered weather network, weather station uh, system where you can um, uh, have a, a uh, an economy and incentivized network for putting weather stations, weather stations all over the world. Um, and that's also been awesome to see and like all the different kind of data feeds that are going to be, that's going to kind of become available over the next year. Uh, you're going to be able to kind of write systems and applications with blockchain economy type uh, primitives directly on, on, on weather. So you can, that's gonna enable all kinds of things like insurance contracts and, and so on. Uh, and kind of like all you know, different kinds of planning and, and so on. And then there's uh, tons of tooling and, and systems built for uh, the whole platform economy. So things like uh, tools for builders and tools for, for clients. Um, there's a ton of um, you know, business opportunities there for a lot of groups uh, to solve like really key, key um, challenges for uh, people in the market. So it's been, been awesome to see uh, a lot of the tech uh, being, being built there. So those are just like a small snapshot of a ton of projects that have been been um, built over the last year and many more to come. So that, that this whole funnel is growing a lot. And so I expect like next year we're going to have, um, you know, even more ecosystem, like a, a larger scale uh, of ecosystem projects building. And so, you know, to the kudos to the all the builders out there that um, built amazing things uh, this year. And, um, you know, so many of us are here to support you. So if whenever you run into uh, any challenges and whatnot, like definitely lean on us. So I wanted to touch a little bit on public goods funding, and I'm gonna um, unfortunately have to go really fast with this, uh, not do justice, but like the good news is that there's, uh, we ran a whole event about funding the commons recently. Uh, so I think it's funding the commons .io, I think is the website. Um, you can search for it and so on. Uh, and we got a, a really awesome uh, set of um, uh, speakers to come and talk to us about different ways of funding projects and the funding communities and funding uh, systems. Um, that take into account kind of this modern um, network oriented view of of the of the production uh, and so where you can start thinking about retroactive uh, systems or um, yeah different different kinds of ways to 
uh, fund the, the production of public goods as opposed to just private goods. One of the key principles here is private utopia. So uh, this is a concept that comes from Eric Drexler. Uh, this is the kind of um, one of one of the things that I think the Web3 community is has really understood in a way that the rest of the world hasn't understood, which is that um, the science and technology enable us enable us to uh, greatly increase the um, the the no, the value in the world by orders of magnitude. And so when you when you're in that realm, it does not at all make sense to kind of um, compete or, or look at the world in any kind of zero sum way. It's like just dramatically better to uh, be working together to um, uh, just scale the the what we can do and scale the reach of uh, science and technology to just greatly increase the um, the value in, in in the world. And so uh, it'd be great to kind of align everybody to you know hit prior utopia as, as fast as we can. Uh, I'm super interested in, in enabling that by uh, helping to close the innovation what I'm sort of describing as the innovation chasm, which is that you know today um, there's a massive market for um, kind of building products and shipping them out into the world, and you know some fraction of that goes into um, technology development, and that's usually sort of primarily led by corporations. And there's you know very robust incentive field and and um, production model there, and tons of economic uh, structures and support structures for for doing that and kind of productizing technology. And then the, the other, other side, there's uh, a ton of um, incentives and, and structures for um, the pursuit of knowledge and to for the discovery of new knowledge and and so on. Like this is the entire side science side, and the which is you know primarily led by academia. And the incentive there um, is is not market oriented, it's or at least not not um, you know uh, money market oriented. It's there's sort of a market and, and incentive structure around uh, recognition and and um, uh, trying to get in, in uh, into like the impact of certain kinds of discoveries and so on, and you know definitely like the the worldwide market for corporations it has many or imagine more funding than science, and so we need to drive a lot more funding towards science to to greatly expand what will be what we know and and increase the reach of, of what we know. But that's not what the bottleneck is. I think the the real bottleneck is in the translation of the science to technology. So so this part of going from ideas and extending what we know. And turning it into technology that we can use and that we can um, expand our uh, our cap capabilities with, like that's where the really bad bottleneck is. And so I'm, I'm increasingly um, interested in in working on structures and techniques that can greatly accelerate this. That can um, make sure that we have really good and effective coordination systems to make um, you know the translation of science and technology happen. And so I think like when you look around the world and it, you feel like you know there's like some deep problems where you know, certainly humanity has by by now sort of figured out what how to solve some of those problems, and it's kind of um, unclear why um, it hasn't like really the solutions haven't really diffused into the world and so on. Uh, often, uh, the the problem is this: is that we do maybe solve the problem in principle, uh, but we haven't done all of the really tough R and D work that goes from um, building a concept all the way to producing technology that can meet the needs of of, of the world and and can be. Um, mass produce or like uh, delivered uh, in large scales to people in the world, and into and be woven into into a product. So this uh, closing the innovation gap, I think, is one of the most important things to to work on. And so we're, we're you know, trying to think about this in terms of learning the lessons from the startup investment investment funding landscape uh, that has you know worked so well for the last twenty years, and see if we can create um, structures like that for. Um, uh, public goods funding and for like network funding or you know public goods or club goods and and those kinds of enable um, uh, networks to to um, build like broadly accessible uh, tools or so think of like a paradigmatic type of structure where you're just uh, creating technology and 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 uh, let, uh, growing the value for everybody and so I think it is definitely possible to create um, a a funding structure. That can you know mirror like really rival the the um, the the corporate world, um, but oriented around networks building, um, uh, public goods. And so I think like this this let's learn what we can from those markets and learn what we can about those those systems, and then um, build like dramatically better uh, funding structures. I tend to think about it as kind of like these funding staircases, where like the, the startup world has become extremely good at like um, you know kind of refining this this whole network oriented. Um, funding structure for for all the different stages, and that's kind of like really skewed in the public goods uh, oriented part of the landscape. Um, you know, the large funders are primarily nation states, and um, they have like very few funding agencies, and it's not as much of a network. Um, and it's sort of like w when you kind of analyze this whole funnel, um, there's it's super lopsided. There's like a ton of funding at the beginning, 
Um, so it's like really easy to get started, but like then there's this like Death Valley in the middle, and then there's some like large funding in the in the later parts, but it's coming from very um, this is very difficult to do anything outside of like what they what they all think um, uh, you should be doing. So uh, you know, I, I think the power of Web three will be really felt once we can we can do kind of the whole end to end thing of like you know develop new science, um, do all the R and D that we need to do, and then productize it and distribute it all the way into the world. And and I think that things like DAOs and things like you know public funding mechanisms, like all of this kind of retroactive public good funding uh, stuff, can really help with this. And I think if we if we do that, then we can get to um, uh, to a much better, better, uh, better world. So um, I think a lot of us will be working on this kind of stuff in, in the intervening time. And one of the uh, cool things that we can do to um, to put in uh, in use some of this these ideas is to use all of this network funding to create structures to fund the technology we're developing now. So things like um, all of the, all of the different software and um, R and D work that we need to do, like create network funding structures to fund all of that. Um, a plug that we are like you know hiring for for um uh people that are interested in this public funding public goods funding um stuff so definitely if you're interested in working in this uh I reach out and i want to kind of like uh end with some ideas for like what might you work on or build or you know what what's going on and what's happening that you might either want to get involved in or um might want to create a new project and uh, and you know kind of get some public funding uh for uh and so i'll give a snapshot of a few a few things to to think about one is like, hey, there's a ton of storage providers around the world already in the Plasma network, and like that's awesome and, and it's really massive, um, but it's not, not well distributed around the world. So it would be great to create the structures to enable a lot more storage providers uh, all around the world to to um, bring storage and in, in, in there and so on. Uh, the client usage is scaling, um, and and a lot of it's very clear from the work this year that tools that tune for a specific use case end up doing uh, extremely well and enable a lot of groups uh, to onboard it from a storage uh, and, and make it super useful for that use case. So we just need more of those kinds of tools tuned for different use cases. So there's a there's a ton of them already, um, but a lot of these are kind of like, tuned, again, tuned to specific use cases. So looking at across the use case set um, and uh, uh, and looking at things that are, that are um, um, empty or something like that and kind of working on those um, might, be, might be super, super useful and super valuable. Creating more connections to other uh, chains and other networks, and enabling um, the stuff that's going on in those networks to then uh, connect to the storage primitives from Plotcoin and vice versa, I think would be extremely, extremely useful. Then, you know, making it easier to onboard massive scale. So uh, we have a ton of capacity. Let's uh, like fill it and use it to uh, sort of like super critical, valuable data for the world. So um, really helping build uh, tooling to onboard uh, hundreds of petabytes or you know exabytes of storage, I think would be. Um, is like sort of like what's needed, right? Like we have this amazing resource and amazing capacity. Let's you know put it to uh, extremely good use and and um, store like super valuable stuff there. Then you know a huge plug to chain state files because uh, you know really making consumer storage products that enable you know everyday uh, uh, users and consumers to be able to use all of this tech uh, is like super key. So um, it's been really awesome to see that you can now have like a Dropbox style service, uh, all Web three powered, all Web three uh, enabled. Um, and like you know, that's fantastic. Like this is stuff that like you know eight years ago seemed completely super far away and like really difficult to do. And like it's, it's awesome to see uh, that that happening now. I think video is one of the really key things. Uh, you know, most of the traffic on the internet is all video. Uh, it's just people consuming and um, uh, and viewing tons of video. So uh, working on this part, uh, enabling building more applications that that use all the tools that have been built so far, like things like the the transcoding networks and um, the storage networks and the distribution networks and so on to uh, deliver tons of um, uh, new kinds of video uh, would be extremely, extremely useful. Uh, then, you know, I think like one of the, the things is, you know, storing developer artifacts um, on IPFS and Plotcoin, like being able to kind of take all of the package managers or all of the M registries or things like container registries and so on, and store and distribute all of that with with Web3 tooling. Um, it's going to be a while until like, all of that is super fast and like super sleek and excellent experience. But all of the hard problems in terms of the the cryptography and the distribution model and so on are are solved. Now we have to work on like making really nice tools and make it um, higher quality and 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 faster for than than alternatives. Then you know kind of like let's connect all the chains together and you know enable uh, cross chain computation and cross chain storage and all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's you know enable 
uh, retrieval markets to be able to kind of have the, the CDN style use case where you can you know, drop an IPFS hash and say, I want this backed up uh, in all these specific regions and I want it delivered with this like low latency. Um, and so having all of that replicated around the world would be, would be really awesome. Then um, again, storage providing is like um, a huge endeavor to run a data center and so on. So like making making that super much easier with your know, technical improvements uh, underneath the hood, like in, in the crypto or um, even in kind of the economic flows, uh, finding better structures for um, for for the economic transactions related to to uh, becoming a source provider, I think would be would be super useful. Uh, one of the big goals is to make Bitcoin green and make the whole network um, uh, uh, just environmentally positive. So this is something that has become a, a, a huge topic in Web3, which is awesome. Um, I think we can, um, you know, I pers personally think, and I think a lot of people in the Falcon Network think that um, Web3 needs to lead the way to create a, a verifiably green um, and environmentally positive uh, outcome in the world. And what's really cool about our tech is that we can create verifiable structures for this and that we can use economic primitives to, um, you know, cause a massive large scale action from groups, like you don't have to get agreement from nation states or convince everybody, you can just start doing it. And so I think that um, we could drag the entire, uh, if we get this right uh, with Flatman, we can um, drag um, the entire blockchain ecosystem into becoming environmentally positive. And like, that would be amazing. It would be a, a super fantastic outcome. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole um, uh, conference that was dedicated to thinking about this. And so you can look into the different projects that are that are going on in this if you're interested. Um, uh, yes, well, there's a whole bunch of other things. If you spend a ton of time talking, I'll, you know, given timing, I, I'll just rush through. Um, would love to kind of structure, make the whole economy much more self-reliant, be able to kind of transact in everything, uh, every, all of the production parts of the, the storage and so on, directly in Talkman. I think that would make um, the whole network more, uh, you know, stronger. And, you know, one of the big things that's coming next year is uh, being able to uh, have different kinds of computation around the network. So, um, you know, you, know, you can think of like storage as one layer. You can think of computation over the state as another layer, which is kind of all the on-chain computations that then can coordinate other layers of, of computation. Uh, and kind of the layer above that is how do you run arbitrary computing uh, computing jobs over all the data, right? So you've stored petabytes of stuff. Um, now what? Like now you want to run computing over that, and you want to you want to um, uh, run a bunch of computation over that data to make it like really useful. How do you do that? And so this is where um, I think a lot of the projects that are going to be uh, shipped or or you know get started some in some cases next year are going to uh, be all about this. And so getting to kind of a large scale, high performance, private um, and in high integrity decentralized uh, computing cloud uh, over the the storage is kind of like where where all this is headed. And Web uh, Web three has to scale massively to get there, right? So like we're very far away from being able to compete with the cloud in this in this regard. Uh, but I think we're getting the primitives together. And you know the, the this is sort of like the picture of the scale. Like we have to dramatically increase the the throughput of of all these chains and and make it um be able to kind of issue computation jobs that are verifiable um, in in massive scale. And you know a, a um the the whole NFT world has been awesome to see as I was mentioning earlier. Um, amazing rise of of um, the whole creator economy. Uh, I I think new types of media are going to really help. So. Again, video making whole video NFTs where like the, the actual movies themselves could be, it would be amazing to see kind of the production of feature length films be entirely Web3 powered, right? Like change the movie industry to uh, use Web3 uh, primitives and reward people better. Um, I think that's like achievable now, you, the, the tech is there. Uh, we just need the economic primitives and some really great example projects. And then there's other kinds of media. So like um, the metaverse stuff can come from these rooms being built and then you start kind of interacting in those rooms and then you wire those rooms together. Um, then you start interacting, have program games and program other experiences in those rooms. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is kind of like the programmability of, of all these spaces and what happens when you connect them. Um, and, you know, kind of like those get wired up into larger spaces and virtual worlds and so on. So it'd be really, really cool to see all of this stuff and all this kind of computation um, in, in these spaces. So yeah, I think um, we can build a metaverse. We probably need a better name now that uh, that uh, Facebook has been trying to like uh, co-op the name and, and uh, uh, screw everything. Um, but we so we should uh, try to like potentially find a name or like take, take the name back or something. But um, I think this is going to be a hugely impactful uh, piece of uh, humanity for the next 10, 15 years. Um, and I think it's really, really important that it, this is all kind of Web3 powered with Web3 values, Web3 principles, 
and it really is going to depend on the next two years of work. So I think in the next two years of work, we can get some like really high quality primitives here. Um, then all the applications built out over the next three to five years will will spell like some like a really really positive future. So definitely work on on all this. Uh, cool. I'm gonna stop there. Lots of stuff going on. Lots of support for lots of different groups. Um, if you're interested in building stuff, like reach out. Um, and you know, everybody's hiring. So uh, everybody around the the whole Web three space is is growing and hiring and whatnot. So if you're interested in this space and uh, and I'm working on it full time, uh, definitely reach out. Uh, cool. I'm gonna stop there. Well, thank you, Juan. That was a great presentation. Learned a uh, learned a ton there. Um, we will get into the question and answers. And um, is one still there? Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> okay, we uh, have some questions here. The first one, um, how will file, Filecoin comply with a GDPR, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, the, the short answer is kind of like in the same ways that the normal cloud systems uh, comply. It's just um, kind of in a more, it's just in a different pathway. So uh, at the end of the day, um, people and organizations are hosting things. Um, and you have many different kinds of systems and protocols that enable um, compliance with those rules. So it, it really varies by jurisdiction, but for example, um, GDPR and so on, like enables you to have like a, a standard process by which you kind of like think and reason about what information needs to be hosted where. So if an application requires um, information to be hosted within some specific nation state boundaries, um, you can model that in Cloudcoin. An application can say, oh, we need to, um, hire these specific storage providers in this specific, specific regions to comply with that. Um, in other cases, it's about kind of like deletion and, and so on, and you can um, enable that as a client. Like you, you, you wanna enable clients and storage providers to fulfill all the local, local structures and local regulations and enable like really a market of um, jurisdictions that, that have different decisions about how software needs to be built, right? So this is a very difficult kind of question. Like you, you don't want a structure that applies one same principle everywhere. Um, you want a flexible structure that enables experimentation with different things and see what works better and enable participants to move between those those regimes to um, to uh, enter the kind of um, transaction environment that they, they want to be a part of, right? And so at the end of the day, protocols need to, um, our tools and systems and so on, and they need to kind of like disallow certain kinds of um, uh, things like, you know, they, they provide integrity checking and distribution and so on. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that, that needs to be up to the individual users, like the clients or the source providers to decide what to do about. Um, and that's kind of where how the, you, you can basically in, encounter those arrangements and decisions and so on. Um, uh, the protocol is flexible enough to enable you to do that. Uh, next question from Dan Forbes. Uh, to what do you attribute the faster than anticipated adoption by browsers? Um, you know, really, I think, so it's a combination of things. So one is, um, you know, a ton of hard work from a number of people, um, in, in doing this. So like, there's a ton of tools that had to be built, um, a ton of coordination across organizations to, to make happen. Um, you know, there's a browser's working group that was like, um, you know, a huge shout out to Dietrich, um, in, in FPL who has been, um, working on this for, for years now and like really achieved like massive, um, success there. Uh, working with uh, browser vendors to to get there. Um, the second thing is like browser vendors who see the future, who um, are work are not afraid to um, try new things and and change structures. So you know, big shout out to Brave and Opera here. Uh, they've been leading the charge on all of the Web three oriented stuff. So both um, adding IPFS um, and adding things like ENS and so on. So like that's been fantastic to see. Um, and also new browsers, so things like Puma and um, and others who've been like experimenting with new new um, new kinds of structures and and, and kind of Web three native uh, oriented browsers. And so that's been I think like the big key. Um, it'll be a while I think until things like Chrome and Safari and um, IE or whatever um, in all, all the kind of um, successors. Uh, forgot what the name of the successor to IE is, but It'll be a while until all of those adopt this this tech, uh, but I think if we 
create an environment where people are switching to Brave and switching to Opera and switching to these other browsers because they're better and they, they understand Web3, then that'll create massive pressure for those Web2 browsers to really adapt and, and enable Web3. Um, next question from Sean Ryan. What skill sets do you look for when hiring uh, for research roles? Uh, it's on the skill set. So, um, you know, everything from from um, approach to like doing good, like strong structured research, like how do you approach question, the, the research questions themselves, what the research product um, is, like um, how do you navigate the, the conceptual landscape? How do you then um, produce results in terms of, um, you know, the actual knowledge generated along the way and how the knowledge is usable and consumable by other groups building things. So um, research is part of like a large integrated system of like, you know, coming up with new ideas, uh, studying those ideas, coming up with like um, the theory and practice of, of those ideas, and then how to weave those ideas into uh, some systems um, and kind of like actually do something with them. So it's, um, th there's a lot that goes into, into all of that. Um, so yeah, um, this is probably, could probably give a whole talk about, about this. Um, but you know, there's probably a bunch of uh, resources on the web, uh, both written and in video that talk about um, you know great, what great research looks like, um, and some you know, probably would defer to us. Um, another question from Dan: um, How do you envision, for instance, a movie as an NFT working? Would participants pay for a piece of the movie or pay for temporary privilege to view it? Well, so I think um, economic structures have to meet the like the, what's what's really going on in the environment, and so um, you know the production of a something like a feature length film um, is a, is an extremely laborious process, uh, uh, laborious intensive creative process where um, you, you're you're making art first and foremost, which is like not like making other stuff, right? So creating art is very different than than manufacturing, for example, like a like a, a um, you know a lot of um, a lot of stuff. And so art is fundamentally different. Um, and you many times, all of the work and time that humans do to produce, be able to produce that art started decades before. Like it's, you know, you look at any amazing art piece and there's components and um, influences either in the artist themselves or like in the piece they wanted to make or like how it remixes other pieces that, you know, is, is really kind of like a, a thread interwoven into a tapestry that's been going for decades or gener uh, many cent centuries in some cases, right? And so. Um, that, that is like, you have to account for that in the economic model for art, art production. And so what that, what that means is like, when you, when you approach kind of creating an NFT for a feature length film, you have to, um, think of like being able to reward all of the people and all the participants that created that. So think of like, um, creating the, the royalty network, uh, and the attribution network related to that film. So instead of like, there being like one single artist, that the artist of that NFT is really kind of like this whole larger co uh, collective and this network of participants, like all the different, and, and the film industry has like this very robust, um, good way of doing this already in terms of uh, attributing all the credits and, and you can see uh, who worked on what part and so on. Like, you know, they, they even care about this so much, uh, rightly so, that they put it at the end of every every piece, right? So at the end of every film, you have the credits roll and like that's the credit attribution and who worked on this piece. Um, and so you can just take the credits right there and like, we, you know, that same kind of structure, weave that into um, an NFT royalty flow and have like some distribution um, uh, of rewards that kind of uh, flow out of the out of the NFT. Um, and then separately, I think you do need to have IP rights work differently there. Uh, I think the buyers of NFTs there need to get the IP for um, what happens when you when you view the movie or when can you show it and so on. And create a structure that is like permissive and open where anybody, you know, potentially anybody can like watch this thing, but there's some um, payment flows that go back to the all the people that created on, on, on these things, uh, or you know, if you charge in a kind of like a token gated sort of way, um, you know, make sure that all of those payments kind of like flow through that royalty royalty graph. So all of that stuff is like now buildable. It's just like nobody has done it yet. So if you're interested in that, like go make it. Um. Uh, next question from anonymous. In terms of computation over data, um, is there support for? machine learning models and AI applications out of the box? Um, so that's definitely something that um, different teams are going to have to work on. So I think uh, the goal is to try and fit whatever's out there already. So there's a, the ML community has been, uh, has produced amazing software in terms of how do you, how do you 
um, deal with all the existing structures and how do you build the right models and so on. So in many cases, you can just plug in Web3 infrastructure into the same software. In some cases, you'll have to like write new software, like new adapters and so on. And in some cases, you might have to like write whole new pipeline, like you know, ML pipeline computing software to kind of like orchestrate the computation over a network like this. Um, the biggest problem there is probably going to be positioning. So if you have like some machine learning um, data set and some you know model and some computation that you want to run over it, like making sure that your computation and the data are like in the same place and that you're not like hopping across like large latency lengths and so on. That's that's what maybe there's a big opening for somebody to go work on that right now. And so doing all the ML pipelines work um, now for IPFS and, and Pathfinder might be it, like well positioned to then ship you know towards the end of next year or like the year after. Um, and I think at that point, like that, that's going to be like in, in super well time to be able to kind of do massive scale ML computation over over Web three stuff. And one of the really cool things here is that using Web three uh, hard cryptography stuff, we can make much better, much more ethical uses of ML, where you have verifiable uh, guarantees about how the things are being used, like where you know classification and so on can be um, steered by ethics policies that are applied direct on top of the models, um, and you get like verifiable proof that like that actually happened that nobody ran some other program, that they only got access to be able to run the, the computation over that data that was, you know, according to the policy. And like, that's, that's something like super amazing and a, and a, and a, and a, a, a um, an unfair advantage over the, the, the web two clouds. And so press into that, like drag the whole world into a much better, more, uh, higher performance, higher quality, cheaper, um, more values oriented, uh, ML system by leaning into the advantages that web three has. Right? Question. Um, with retrieval markets in place, how how would the payment uh, for this happen? Would a client need a uh, file to retrieve a movie for instance? So there's two basic, I mean, there's a lot of different models for, for file distribution, but there's two major ones. One is where um, the publisher pays uh, and one is where the, the retriever pays. So um, many publishers are interested in you looking at their stuff. So like a website or um, a, a video or something like that. So the kind of like standard process is that um, publishers tend to pay for that distribution model. Uh, in other cases, um, when you know the publishers put out the data, but like clients, maybe it's like really big. This usually maps to the size of the data. Once you start hitting terabytes, um, then you want the clients to pay for the retrieval. Uh, and then in that case, you you might you might you might pay Pathfind. Um, so the the retrieval markets are like exploring both you know both ends of that spectrum and kind of like all the spots in between. And some other interesting models that people have come up with around around economic flows for, for retrieval. Um, and so you, you want to enable kind of like both both structures. The the one that's more popular right now is is just like the publisher state. Like so, you, so think of like the standard CDN style setting where like you have some some content or like some lists of content and you want the CDN to spread that out over uh, over the world um, and to then serve it from there. And so like you know that that should work and like the publisher should pay in Firepoint. Hey, um, that's the end of those questions, but uh, you had an amazing roadmap for 2022. What are you most excited about? Um, really, I think like probably using public funding good structures to make new computation networks that um, you know do, do can do like large scale um, uh, computation to run a metaverse environment like that. It's kind of like the three pieces together. Um, so that's what I think like um, you know, maybe each work on each one of these things in individually first and then and then piece them together um thank you so much for your presentation it was amazing and uh next up we are thank going you so to much have, yeah thank you um next up we're gonna have colin schwartz he's a product manager at tsafe for storage and files and for his talk it's going to be on accessible distri uh, distributed storage and how tsafe is improving the foundations of the internet so we'll get uh, Colin up to the stage. Hey, dude. Hey, Kwame. How you doing? Doing good. You ready to go? Ready to go. All right. Well, thanks, Kwame, and thanks, Juan. That was an incredible talk. And it's a real privilege to get to speak after you, especially since I'll be talking about uh, some of the things that we've been building here at Chainsafe on top of those protocols uh, that you helped to create. So really excited to hop into it. I guess a bit more about myself, uh, Colin, I've been working at Chainsafe for uh, about three and a half years now. 
I started out doing more research and um, technical writing, but I quickly transitioned into uh, project management. I was the manager of Lodestar for several years, uh, as well as Chainbridge for a brief spell. But in the last 18 months, I've been focusing in more and more on product work, uh, which has become more of an emphasis at Chainsafe in general, and specifically on the products that we're building in the distributed storage space. Uh, so Chainsafe storage and Chainsafe files. So my talk today is about accessible distributed storage and how Chainsafe is improving the foundations of the internet. And uh, I know that that's sort of a bold statement and it's intended to be. And part of what I wanna do here today before I jump into speaking about the products themselves is sort of get everyone more excited about storage and our relationship to data. And I think that it's, you know, it's not as, uh, it's not as much of a hyped topic as some other things in our space like NFTs or DeFi um, but I think that it deserves even more attention than it's been getting, and that's for a number of reasons. Why should we care about storage? I mean, first of all, data storage and retrieval is completely foundational to the internet, and everything that we get excited about in the Web3 space is built on top of it in some way. Uh, and solid foundations create stable structures. Uh, I took that from, from an article that Phil wrote last month, actually. Shout out to Phil. Uh, so we can't build decentralized products on a centralized infrastructure. And um, unfortunately, all too often that is still happening today. And so if we want really stable foundations for all of these um, Web3 aspirations that we have, we have to be really cognizant of our relationship to storage and retrieval and to data in general. So to follow this point a little bit further, I have a bit an analogy here. and. Um, I pose the question, is data the new oil? Uh, I know that can be a bit reductionist and obviously there's a lot of differences between these two resources, but the point I'm trying to make here is that both are incredibly important to humanity over the last hundred years. And we can learn some lessons from how we've interacted with resources in the past and perhaps how we need to be interacting with resources in the future. So as we know, oil is one of the most important and sought after resources on the planet for at least the past 100 years. And in the last 10 or 20 years, data has been replacing it in terms of overall value and relevance to human society. Um, some obvious comparisons are that both data and oil have been monopolized by a small number of huge corporations. Uh, and in both cases, corporate greed has led to massive problems. Now with oil, these problems are abundantly apparent by this point, obviously, climate change as a result of burning oil and other fossil fuels, air pollution for the same reasons, uh, oil spills themselves or catastrophic events. Um, so the greed and centralization of this resource has become manifest in a bunch of really obvious negative ways. Um, with data, it's also being centralized in the hands of even fewer corporations at this point. And that also has had really negative consequences. They're just less apparent at this point. Um, but yeah, the proliferation of fake news, um, things like the Cambridge uh, Analytica, Facebook scandal are just a few examples. The fact that these social media companies are spying on everyone's information uh, and then creating these algorithms that get you addicted to their platform. I mean, I could go on, on, on and on about this stuff. Most of it is uh, things that many of you are probably already aware of. But I, I think that what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't treat data in the same way that we've treated other really important resources in the past. Um, and we have an opportunity now to take it back. Unlike oil, data production is actually distributed fairly evenly, both geographically and between individuals. Um, it's really just the collection and the exploitation of that data and the storage of that data that has been really centralized and, the, and, and it's that side of things that has led to all these negative outcomes. So we still have a chance to retake control of our relationship to digital data, how it's stored, how it's retrieved, how we interact with it. And some of the new technologies that we've been talking about throughout this conference will enable us to do just that. And I think that we can build a much better and more equitable foundation for the internet 
if we leverage some of this new technology to regain control of our data and our relationship to it. So blockchain and other peer-to-peer -peer technologies can allow us to have a better relationship with data than our grandparents had with oil. And the monopolization of cloud storage is not a foregone conclusion. There is a better way. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of this presentation. So before I get into chatting about uh, the products that we're building, I wanted to point out that there is actually this long history of peer-to-peer -peer content distribution and um, data storage that dates back way before blockchain even existed. So you can see I have a timeline here that actually starts in 1969. And if you'll notice, Bitcoin is all the way over here on the right in 2009. So there's this rich history of people and organizations and technologies that have developed over the last several decades that have gotten us to where we are today uh, and enabled um, some of the technologies and protocols that I'm going to talk about. So in order for you guys not to have to go and uh, read all those tiny points on that timeline, I've broken up the history of peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer data storage into four epochs. And each of those epochs have characterized with um, a product that, that is indicative of it. Um, obviously, these are not the only products in those epochs. I just use them as an example. Um, so the first epoch is characterized by things such as Napster, which was an early peer-to-peer -peer storage and sharing platform. Um, however, it did rely on a central server to coordinate lookups. Um, so it was a step in the right direction, but there was definitely still some level of centralization going on there. The second epoch is characterized by programs like LimeWire, which I'm sure many of you remember. Uh, this is when peer-to-peer -peer, um, data achieved some sort of large-scale adoption. And these technologies also eliminated that central index um, that I was talking about. So continuing the push towards real peer-to-peer -peer, um, data sharing. The third epoch is characterized by programs like BitTorrent, which offered direct peer-to-peer -peer communications over a TCP port. And they eliminated the need for centralized trackers using distributed hash tables. So this got us you know, pretty far and close to where we are now today. And today we're in this fourth epoch. Um, but what all three of these previous epochs lacked was an incentivization system. And so, you know, if participants in the network were either doing so out of the goodness of their heart or they were charging money, which sort of reintroduced an aspect of centralization. Uh, and so it wasn't until we have blockchain technology that we could actually introduce this trustless incentive layer for peer to peer storage. And that's exactly what Filecoin does. It's leveraging blockchain to incentivize the miners to store data and to serve that data. And it's incredibly powerful as a result of that. And it sort of guarantees that there's this correct incentive model um, that we know that we can rely on this storage actually being distributed and decentralized. Uh, and furthermore, something else that Filecoin brings to the table, which has never happened before in this whole history, is that it brings uh, verifiable storage. So we can actually cryptographically verify that uh, through proof of space time that a miner has the storage space they say they do. And not only did that not exist for uh, previous iterations of this sort of technology, it also doesn't exist for uh, client server models. And so the entire cloud doesn't have this, right? If you use Google or Amazon, um, you just have to trust that they have that storage. and um, with Filecoin, you don't have to trust, you can verify. So that's my little uh, history lesson. And uh, the next step here is to chat about how uh, we at Chainsafe became involved in this whole space. So uh, basically since the beginning of Chainsafe, we've been huge fans of Protocol Labs and of IPFS. And um, we've used IPFS in a number of ways for several different uh, projects and products over the years. And so we were very excited um, by the, the announcement of Filecoin. Uh, and then of course, by the impending Filecoin launch last year. And um, we were really honored and privileged when we received a grant from Protocol Labs to build an alternate implementation of the Filecoin blockchain written in Rust called Forest. Um, so we were really, by that time, we had become deeply invested in the ecosystem and uh, that also coincided with when we started to build out more of our in-house products at Chainsafe. And one of our um, big product philosophies here is that 
we think we need to make Web3 technology as easy to use as Web2 tech is currently. And so when we have these new protocols, they're incredibly powerful and exciting, uh, but without the correct tooling and products on top of them, they can be really hard to access for everyday people. And so we thought that in order to contribute further to this incredible ecosystem, we should create products that gave people easier access to it. And so that's how Chainsafe Storage and Chainsafe Files were born. Chainsafe Storage um, makes Filecoin and IPFS really easy to use and to interact with for developers. And Chainsafe Files does the same, but for everyday normal users. So before I hop into more details about the products, I just want to give a huge shout out to the team behind them. Uh, I'm not going to go through and introduce every single person, but I just want to say that it's an incredible privilege to work with these individuals on a daily basis. Um, they're all incredible. I couldn't imagine a better group of people to work with. Uh, and it's thanks to them that we are where we are now. So I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge that. All right, so files and storage. They're two separate products, but they both exist within the distributed file storage vertical. And they do provide similar functionality, but for different consumer preferences. So on the one hand, we have storage, which is essentially a set of exposed APIs uh, or can, considered a developer tool, uh, as well as a pinning service. And then on the other hand, we have files, which is a end user consumer grade product. Some more differences. Storage is a little more flexible um, because of its status as a developer tool, whereas files is more usable. I do want to point out here that storage is actually very easy to use for anyone with even a rudimentary knowledge of software development. It is very accessible for that group of people. It's just that files is accessible for your grandmother. Anyone can, anyone can use it whatsoever. Um, obviously, storage requires a bit more technical knowledge, whereas files is fully accessible to anyone with a computer or a smartphone. And then a really important distinction to also point out is that chain safe storage, uh, everything that is uploaded to it is intended for public consumption. And that's by design. We want people to be able to plug into this product and to use it as a storage layer for basically any use case that they can think of. Um, and on the other hand, chain safe files is built with privacy and security top of mind. So anything uploaded to files will not be publicly available. Uh, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, so just to clear up any remaining confusion, here's a quick diagram that explains how um, all the products sort of relate to one another and to the underlying infrastructure. So at the protocol level, we connect to IPFS and to Filecoin with both products. Um, we use IPFS for hot storage. We use Filecoin for archival storage. Because currently Filecoin miners only accept um, a certain minimum size of deals, when we get some uh, smaller files uploaded through either through either tool, uh, they get batched on IPFS, bundled up, and then periodically sent over to Filecoin um, for extra backup and distribution and redundancy. Um, so then at the infrastructure level, we have our chain safe storage APIs. And those are exposed. When you go to the chain safe storage website, you can get API keys to access that infrastructure. Uh, and then you can also use our pinning service. And then chain safe files, also routes all of its traffic through the Chainsafe storage APIs, but it is uh, it has a comprehensive front end and um, it's a end user file storage solution. Uh, so there's the site if you want to go check out storage for yourself. Like I said, it's basically a set of exposed APIs plus a pinning service. You can see in the screenshot here, we have two different API keys that you can generate with storage. The first is our uh, standard storage APIs. Uh, and then the second are S3 compatible APIs. And I think that you know, this one is especially exciting because it means that you can change a single value and then you can switch over from any sort of S3 compatible storage layer that you were using and automatically um, plug in Chainsafe storage as your storage layer. And we've had people do this many times. They've raved about how easy it was um, and so this is a huge functionality that will enable us to get more traffic from web two and just making it really easy for developers to switch over to distributed storage is one of the best ways that we can onboard uh, more web two folks into 
this new and exciting ecosystem. Uh, so I got a few use cases here just to further illustrate my point. This is obviously not an exhaustive list, but um, number one, NFTs, um, off-chain data and metadata has been a huge use case for IPFS and for Filecoin and chain safe storage is no exception. Uh, we have a bunch of projects that are using storage for that. Uh, also video game libraries and assets that are not NFT related um, can also be stored on chain safe storage. Uh, and then if you do have a, a, a game that has in-game NFTs, having all of that in the same place and in a distributed context can be really powerful. Um, any decentralized application that needs storage can plug in uh, without any problems. And then four, this is a huge one, and this is what I was talking about earlier, any other applications that need to store persistent data in a decentralized manner, uh, especially those that are S3 compatible, which is a huge percentage of what's out there, um, can literally change a single value and all of a sudden they have a distributed storage layer. So chain safe files, also encourage you to go check it out. There's the link. This is our landing page. We're offering encrypted file storage and we have sharing, which is our latest big feature release. Um, so first and foremost, Chainsafe Files offers high security and high privacy. And so anything that is uploaded to Chainsafe Files is end-to-end -end encrypted in transit and at rest. And that means that uh, not only can Chainsafe not see any of your files, uh, which is you know obviously the opposite of all of these Web2 storage solutions where the companies have access to everything and they use and exploit that data as they please. Um, but once your files are uploaded to IPFS and to Filecoin, which are public networks, uh, they will also be encrypted there. And so nobody can see them uh, in that context either. So furthermore, to build on this whole privacy um, value proposition, the user's account credentials are actually stored on their own devices, not on our servers. So we don't have access to that either. And we've enabled a Web3 login which means that you can actually log in with your Ethereum wallet. So when I use files, I log in with my MetaMask and um, I don't actually need to provide an email or a phone number or any other personal identifying information such as that if I don't want to. Uh, and then when we launch um, billing early next year, uh, we will of course be accepting a variety of cryptos. Um, and so that means that for the most privacy concerned user, you can log in with your anonymous Web3 identity you can pay with crypto and you can rest assured that everything you upload will be private from us and from everyone else on the internet. Um, another big aspect of Chainsafe Files is data ownership. And this is going back to the beginning of my talk um, where I was saying we need to take back data. We need to regain control of the data that we produce, the data that we store and reimagine our relationship to how we interact with online data in general. And um, I think I can speak for a lot of us when by saying, I don't think the right move is to wait for government regulators to step in here. Um, when we have the power to create our own products that actually allow users to regain control of their data. Uh, and so that's exactly what Chainsafe Files does. By leveraging IPFS and Filecoin, we can return data ownership to the user. And um, we've actually built a CLI tool that enables users to access their content independently of our product. Um, so basically, you know, sometimes people ask, it's great that you're using these decentralized networks, but by creating this portal, this service to access them, are you not reimposing some level of centralization? Uh, and the answer to that question is no, because using this CLI tool, which is available on our, uh, on our GitHub and is of course open source, you can actually access everything that you've uploaded to IPFS and Filecoin without using chain safe files. So if we were to be censored in your country, um, if we were to go down for whatever reason, if we were to be taken down, if you just don't wanna use us anymore,